Thanks for having me. It's um, Go Easy on my I've only done this a couple of times. Um, I'm presenting a, uh, an overview of the data project, which is a program that is, is a collective group of people that put together. I've probably played quite a minor role, so I'm not going to take too much, um, too much credit for the, uh, the good outputs that have come out of the program. There's a, a good team uh, in New Zealand that have pulled together. Uh, Richard Pentreath, a, a colleague of Ross's, has, has driven this really hard out of New Zealand, but we've had great support from the group that Angus has actually alluded to, the Frontline Advisor Group. They've mainly um, also dropped in and, and really helped us across this program across the country. So I, I sort of, um, I can't claim this, but I pinched it and I think it sort of sums up pretty nicely where we're going with this, that um, there's a lot of talk now about data and big data and the importance of it in, in driving, uh, driving businesses now and, and driving industries forward. And, and I looked at it like this, it's, it's the new oil, we've got to find it and refine it, mine it and refine it. So that, that whole process of getting the data, making some sense of it and then, and then really trying to utilise it and get it into our industry. And um, we were pretty barren of, of good data since about 2008 when the ABS data became too expensive and unfortunately we were forced into a corner where we had to just pull away from collecting really, you know, robust and um, continued statistics year on year and, and we fell short there for quite some time. So this program was, um, was kicked off by the IAC um, after a roundtable discussion, both, uh, I think it was a stakeholders roundtable that Annie was quite um, actively involved with. The main theme to come out of the group was that we don't have good robust industry data. It's hard to make informed decisions and we need to improve that. Um, we we're fortunate that it was seen as a priority and it was then subsequently funded and uh, the project was commissioned back in 2014 as a 12 month pilot to, uh, to get cracking. So why would we undertake um, such a project? I th better thought um, <laughs> poor old John Dollison can't be here this, this weekend by, by all accounts and so we better give him a mention to make sure he, uh, he feels like he's part of it. But I thought he summed up that pretty well. You know, getting a basic grip on our tree data is fundamental to giving us information we need to make informed decisions about our industry and take action to ensure its profitability long term. And I think that's ultimately what this is about and, uh, and this information can be really powerful and help us make some really, really strong decisions going forward. So what did we do? Um, oh, so I better throw this one in here. Yeah, this is how I looked at it. My old mate Donald Rumsfeld, he's bowled some beauties out over the years, but um, there are known knowns. These are the things we know that we know. There are known unknowns, that's to say there are things we know that we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. These are the things we know we don't know. And I thought this data project was a bit like that. There was a bunch of stuff out there we knew we knew, but we sort of wanted to quantify it. And then there was the, the known unknowns. We know there's some stuff out there, but we've really, yeah, it's unknown, but we've got to get it. And then there there'll be things that will pop out of this project that we didn't know we didn't know. And that's been the case. And so that's a really, that's a really positive thing. So we set about doing this in three ways. Um, we created a, an online tree registry, which would um, allow us to input information, tree numbers by variety, by region, and start to build up a really good collection of, of historical data on the, on the crop, on farm, and also any new plantings going in the ground and start to gain a better picture of where we're at as an industry. Um, as it says, there, area planted, tree densities, tree age, rootstocks. The more information we could get, the better we're going to get out of this program. That was our intention, and that's what, we, uh, that's what we set out to do. A national crop estimate, to my understanding, it hadn't been done before. It's a really powerful um, task to undertake to know what's coming um, so often. We have these discussions in March, April, and we say, oh, it was a hell of a big crop. Didn't know that was quite as going to be as big as it was, or we don't know what we're going to do now, we're going to have to mark it differently. Well, how about we just rewind the clock and have a better look at what's on the tree, put a process in place to evaluate as we're going through the season, perhaps what's coming, and maybe we can manage it accordingly. And ultimately, the National Packhouse Survey was the verification uh, of the actual, actually what was picked. So after we made that forecast, going through back to the pack houses, taking the survey, obviously it takes a season for most of that fruit to be sold to determine where do we actually end up against our forecast. So here's a shot of the, just a snapshot of the screen. If those of you who used the program would see what the online tree registry looked like. A nice little platform that the guys in New Zealand set up. It was pretty straightforward to go through. Drop down boxes, by block, very intuitive and you could work through and enter in the data um, quite straightforward and uh, it became you know ultimately um, this had to be user friendly to get the uptake I'll talk a little bit more about how the uptake has been and, and were there any blockers there but 
we think this, this isn't holding us back. This is nice and fluent. This works well. And it allows us to continue to use this type of work year on year and it shouldn't be, shouldn't be a challenge. So we start to work through the sorts of things that came out of the tree registry. And this is really interesting. So there's not a huge amount of surprises through here. So those of you who are quite intimately involved in the industry will s you won't pick too many major surprises, I wouldn't have thought. But so you see down here on the bottom, we're estimating around about 9,450 hectares of planted area in the apple space and around about th 3415 uh, in the pear space. Um, no surprises, Victoria as a collective group uh, are right up there, taking 42% as a share of the industry's production. Um, and these are sort of evening out a little bit more probably than what I thought, 10, 10, 11, 12. New South Wales just up there a little bit and the Mayor of Stanthorpe down there tells me that one's probably wrong. They're building pack houses on a daily basis and that that one probably should be a little bit closer to Victoria's. But, you know, I beg to differ, Steve, but you'll have, you'll have your right of reply shortly. Um, Pair space, yep, no surprises. Victoria, there it is, up around that 90% mark that we've always thought, and a scattering, a declining scattering into the other states. So as we split that up as a variety mix, um, you can see there the observations that I've made out of this is, I mean, 28%. Uh, now, this is obviously a national percentage across the board. Um, I dare say that's a wee bit higher. And we get into some regions and that would be well into the 30s, well into the 30s, more like the high 30s as a percentage of the regions make up of that particular variety. Again, doesn't come as a surprise, um, but hopefully more as a great big red flag, perhaps, just swinging in the breeze that you, if you haven't seen already, means you may want to um, think about some other sand pits to jump into and, and which ones are they. Um, traditionally, we always had this category called other which made up um, jazz, Kansy, these other varieties that we'd said aren't a major variety yet, don't have their own specific space. It's interesting, you know, I've got to get my colours right, but I think we're down here for that one. Is that right? Does that look right down the back? 9%? Um, it's starting to take a pretty big chunk when you start comparing it back against um, up some other things that are on here. I think we're probably at a point now quite a few emerging new varieties, acreage coming up, we need to, that's the thing the program can do is actually start giving them a name and identifying them and actually getting them up here so we can actually see what influence are these new and emerging varieties now having on our overall varietal mix. Oh, what have I done? There you go. So just having a look at the density now, now that these outputs out of the uh, tree registry side of things. Um, this, is, this is interesting, so we've got uh, in the blue, this is a less than 1,000 tree density. In the red, 1,000 to 1,800. And in the green, is greater than 1,800 trees per hectare and, a per and as a percentage of the planting. Tassie just punching above their weight here and, and uh, potentially pushed on a little bit as a percentage of the planted area into the higher densities, perhaps a little bit more than some other regions. The caveat to all of this is that it's only as good as the data we put in and that will only continue to make the data more robust and there are times, we, we've definitely got some regions that participated heavily and others that were, were lagging and, and we can question the data a little bit and we can interrogate it but um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting to see it, um, to see how it's trending through here and, you know, and if we want to jump and have a look, it's, um, you know, New South Wales is probably there um, with, with the least percentage of higher density plantings, which from some of the things I've seen, some regions you would say yes and others you'd say no. So it's, it's all reasonably consistent. Tassie there, a little bit of an anomaly saying there's a larger percentage of high density and, you know, it could well be right, but we're, it's first year, this is the data we've got and this is why it's going to be really important to press on with this program. Then we go to rootstocks. Um, again, not too many surprises here. 106 big percentage of what's gone in. We know why. Um, still, you know, regions such as Stanthorpe, large percentages of 106, it's a suitable rootstock for that region. They're comfortable with it. They know how to handle it. Um, it's a pr it's a quite a significant growing region and it shows that, you know, everybody's still got a decent chunk of that. And again, we dropped down to M26, which was, you know, a preferred option there for quite some time as something with a little less boogie and something that was going to be a little bit more productive and it's no surprises that's there. And then we've got a scattering of nines and other bits and pieces. Um, you know, I'd like to see, <laughs> we can come back and start to see these nines take up a bigger 
bigger percentage of this pie, and, and, uh, but it's not going to be suitable for all regions. So the national crop estimate, it was kind of crystal ball stuff, really. Um, and we're trying to have a bit of a look into the future, but a bit of an educated look into the future. And so we set about doing the national crop estimate. Um, this involved, you know, one-on-one -on -one grower surveys. What are you seeing? What are you thinking? Looking at some historical, all backed up and overlaid with some uh, regular fruit sizing data, which our, um, which our great people on the ground were doing at reasonably regular intervals for us to, to say, well, you know, the way we're tracking this, and when we throw this into um, systems like OrchardNet, as Angus explained, we can start to look and see what's been happening in the past, and we can say, well, we actually look like we're tracking five or six mil above average here, and it just keeps tracking through, and it starts to, that has a big impact across the national crop. Um, and also, we, um, we thought that, in order to see how robust the model was, we better actually go back and have a look at applying that model against the 13-14 the crop, uh, sorry, 14-15 crop, to see uh, how well is this model working out and, and is it accurate to actually verify the forecast that was put in place for the 14 crop. And uh, I'm pleased to say it's come in, you know, uh, I think Ross was saying just under 2% um, as a... As a, as a it was accurate to within 2%. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so we're really pleased. That gives us some confidence that the model we're using, the way we go forward, um, hopefully will be within a similar level of accuracy for the 15 crop. Things to take out of this, a significant jump from the previous season uh, into what we're expecting, the crop that has just been picked. Everybody knows it's quite a large crop. And uh, pears, steady, arguably a steady decline. Um, but it's reasonably stable there. No big ups, no big downs. This is this is the major one uh, to be looking at up here. So this is just showing that percentage change, and and that's around about 15.3% uh, up on the previous apple crop there. So that's a that's a big jump, um, and it's quite interesting. And it's funny how accurate often anecdotally things are. And you get around the country and you chat to everyone. And if I heard People say, oh, I reckon we're about 12 or 15% up. Oh, if I heard that once, I heard it about 40 times. And it's interesting that our numbers are dropping out reasonably similar there. Um, in the pear space, we're seeing a 3.8% shift up from the previous crop. Um, and totally across the board for palm fruit collectively, that's 12.2% just jumped off the corner there. Here we go, just breaking it down by variety uh, and, and in ton, tonnes per hectare. Um, so whilst we're significantly up on the, uh, the 2014 number, we're still lagging by, by international standards. If you want to start pegging us um, against, you know, here we are here, that's your 35, bit over 35 tonne there. There's, we can jump, jump at shadows a little bit or we can sort of argue that, oh, it's only the data that's gone in, but, you know, it's probably not too far off. There is still some real dragging happening on out there and... and um, some people really struggling to take, go to the next step and consistently bring those high yields right across the farm. And these are true averages. This is includes planted and non-bearing and, and the whole bit. So, you know, uh, I'm probably a little bit disappointed when I say that number more than anything, but uh, that number is what it is and that's what's come out of this data. Again, the more we do this project and the more we churn it out, the more hopefully we'll be, have more faith in that number and then can really be quite, quite precise at what we want to do when we see these numbers. Just coming in for a summary here now, the National Packhouse Survey, again, this was the verification of what we'd done. It allowed us to go back, look at the actual crop picked in 2014, confirm the forecast. We're only just getting those numbers in now. That process is really only just coming in and, and being complete as we're generating the data. Um, there you can see, based on the fruit pick pack, the actual sales, and uh, it's, um, it's giving us those numbers, which I was saying, give or take one or two percent, which we're really pleased with for a first effort. Just some concluding comments. It's as it says, the ongoing success of this is it's going to depend on, on the information that we put in. It's got to be timely and it has to be accurate. And I encourage you all, if we're fortunate enough that this goes ahead again, which I strongly hope that it does, that you participate, that you make the effort and make the time to make this a job that has to happen. And collectively, you'll all be rewarded for the information that comes out of it. But we can't rely on a few regions all doing it and some others just throwing some token data in. It's just, it's too important. I mean, I haven't even mentioned things like when you want to start talking about biosecurity or anything like that and all of a sudden we need to know how many hectares of a particular variety in a particular region. I mean, there are a lot of implications for doing this type of work. Um, it is entirely confidential. 
um, and it's only aggregated data for the purpose of reporting here. And so if there are any hesitations around that side of things, rest assured that um, uh, that's, that's not, that's not going to be an issue and it, it does remain confidential. So um, it's really important. Quick thank you to the team. Uh, here we've got Susie Murphy White over in WA doing a great job for us over there. Tony Filippi, Matt McMahon, Jabbar Khan, uh, Richard Pentreath down the right, the banana bender down here, he'll be up again here in a minute. Ross Wilson, Susie Green, great team. Predominantly the same team that are part of Future Orchards and they're really reliable and, and I can't thank them enough for allowing us to, uh, to pull this together. Thanks very much.